Good morning, church. Please join me as we go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this mid-autumn Sunday morning in the High Rockies. We thank you, Father, for waking us and helping us get to our place of worship safely. We realize, Father, that not all in this vast world in which we live woke up this morning to see the light of a brand new day. So thank you. We thank you, Father, for keeping us warm from the chill on cold days and cool on hot ones. We thank you, Father, for providing food, shelter, and the necessities of life for all who are gathered here this morning. Our prayers are that we recognize these blessings as gifts from God and reach out to help the less fortunate ones who cross our paths daily. Dear Heavenly Father, our prayer list is long and concerning. It reaches out to you, Father, asking thy help in providing healing and comfort to all, including those mentioned this morning. And now, dear Heavenly Father, as we prepare to enter into our worship service, we ask you to bless our preacher. Give him ready recall of the message he's prepared for us today. And thank you, Father, for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. That's our prayer in Jesus' holy and most precious name. Let's all say amen. Good morning. Please turn your hymn book to 747. 747. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall be lead. 
Please turn your hymn books to 680. 680. B. this time, please turn your hymn books to 371. 371 as we prepare our minds to partake of the precious body and blood of the Lord.
Would you turn with me from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23? And we'll be reading 23 through 26. I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. In the following verses, we're reminded prior to partaking in this communion that we're to examine ourselves, that we're to put away the sinful acts that are in us, that we're to remember why we are doing this. Jesus gave this command that we remember him. And at this time, we're honored to be able to do that. Would you bow with me, please? Father in heaven, we are so grateful. Father, we're grateful for the many gifts that you give us. But Father, the greatest gift you have given us is that of your son, Jesus Christ. We're grateful for the love that motivated him to come to this earth and walk among us as a man and the love that allowed him to submit to crucifixion, to give up his life in pain so that our sins could be redeemed. Father, as we partake of this bread, we pray that you will bless it, that you'll help us to remember that Jesus did sacrifice his body for us and for our sins. And it's in his name that we pray, amen. Let's continue our thanks for the cup. Dear Heavenly Father, we know that your word teaches that without the shedding of blood, there is no redemption. And we know that Jesus willingly allowed his blood to be shed to wash away our sins. Father, as we partake of this cup, help us to reflect on our sins. Father, help us to repent of those sins Help us to put them away from us and resolve to go forward doing better because we were bought with such a great price. Please bless us as we partake of this cup. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Sing the third verse. Feast divine all.
separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, this is a convenient time for us to take up a collection. In the New Testament, we're commanded to participate in the activities of the church by contributing of our means. We're encouraged in the New Testament to do that in a cheerful manner. The funds that are collected are used to help spread the gospel, to help provide benevolence, to carry on the work of the church. As we pray about this, I encourage you to pray that we do that in a good manner. Would you bow with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, you have given us so many blessings. Chief among those is the gift of your Son, but Father, also you provide for us every moment of our lives. You sustain us. You give us a beautiful day to enjoy. You give us friends, families, and brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, you give us work that we're able to do with our hands. Father, at this time, as we take up this collection, help us to hold the things of this world, the material things, in the appropriate value that they have as a gift from you that is to be used to glorify you. Father, we pray that the funds that are collected will be used wisely and effectively in spreading your word and showing your kindness and love to others. Father, help us to always remember that we exist to glorify you. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. If you would, please mark your hymn books to 880, 880, which will be the invitation song immediately after the lesson. And then if you would, please turn your hymn books to 513, 513. And if it's not a burden to you, would you please stand? Standing on the promises of Christ by me, through eternal ages and his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing.
The scripture reading this morning is Genesis 12, 1 through 4. Now the Lord has said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Standing on the promises of God. We are all familiar with promises. Some we give to others, and some we expect from others. Unfortunately, whether intentional or unintentional, we are not always able to keep our promises. With God, this is not the case. 1 Corinthians 1.9, God is faithful, through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. 2 Thessalonians 3.3, but the Lord is faithful faithful, and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. He is to be trusted and believed. Why should we stand on the promises of God? We should stand on the promises of God because of who he is. When standing on the promises of God, we must believe that God is able. We must believe that God is able. Now the Lord said to Abram, Genesis 12, 1, go from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. We're standing on the promises of God. Why should we believe that God is able? Because his attributes demand that we trust him. God knows everything we are going through at this very moment and what we will go through in the future. God has already seen next week. God has already seen next year. He is the omniscient, all-knowing God. And this is the God that Abram centered his faith in. One who, because believed by him to be the possessor of heaven and earth, Genesis 14, 22. He believed him to be the sovereign judge of all the nations, Genesis 15, 14. He believed him to be the sovereign judge of all the earth, Genesis 18, 25. He believed him to be the disposer of the forces of nature, Genesis 18, 14. He believed him to be the exalted Lord. Genesis 14, 22. He believed him to be the eternal God. Genesis 21, 33. For Abraham, Yahweh was not only God. He was also his personal God in closeness of a relationship. God called Abram 
to go forth from his country. Listen to what it says. Because Genesis 12 marks a shift as the Lord narrows his focus to Abram and his descendants and begins to work through a specifically chosen people. Bible says in Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, According to the power that works within us, Ephesians 3.20. Hebrews 11.8 says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. See, God is able. Though Abraham did not know where he was going, uh, uh, he went out by faith. Uh, and I always say, well, if you can't leave it, then you don't believe it. He had to leave everything. Abram had to detach from everything that he was attached. God called him away from his country and his family because God wanted Abram to totally rely on him. And the promise, uh, leaving his country, it would avoid any distractions or influences from his family or countrymen. Uh, Abram is the example of how Christians should respond to the call of the Lord. If you remember in Luke 9, 3, when the Lord sent out the disciples, he told them, take nothing for your journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money. Do not even have two garments apiece. We are called to totally rely on God. That's why he says, do not take any of these things that may be a distraction. God has called us and has given us a promise that we can stand on, a promise that will give us eternal life if we heed to his word. Listen in. Standing on the promises of God, we will need God's assurance. Listen in verse number two and three here. And I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now notice that God assures Abram that he would deliver on his word, and God will deliver every time. See, God is not repeating himself here. He says, and I will, and I will, and I will. God is making sure that Abram is assured that he's going to deliver on his problem. And the Lord is not uh, repeating himself because he is unsure of himself. It is man that is unsure of himself. The Lord will always ensure, assure, secure, and make sure his promises are made certain. It is man that is uncertain of himself. God gives the promise, and we respond to the promise. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. But coming alone does not do it. Jesus said, uh, those who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest, but you must take my yoke upon you. You must learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and only then will you find rest for your soul. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. In Romans chapter 4, verse 20 and 21, Bible says, Yet with the respect to the promise of God, 
speaking of Abraham, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully assured that God what had promised, he was able to perform it. But are we fully assured, like Abram, that God will do what he has promised? God made a covenant to David. God does not violate or, or change his words. In Psalms 89, 34, it says, My covenant I will not violate the Lord said, nor will I alter the words that come forth from my mouth. Once I have sworn by my holiness, he could swear to nothing higher than himself. But once I've sworn by my holiness, he said, I will not lie to David. His descendants shall endure forever. His, strong, his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, and the witness in the sky is faithful. But did God fulfill that promise? Luke chapter 1 verse 69, he has raised up a horn of salvation for us. Where? In the house of David. He said, I would not violate my covenant. Romans chapter 1 verse 1, Paul a bond servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised, listen, beforehand through his prophets in the holy scriptures concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. According to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Joshua chapter 21, 45. It says, not one promise. Listen. Not one promise which the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed. Not one of them all came to pass. See, standing on the promises of God. We can accomplish things we didn't think that we were able to. Uh, let me help you out. Uh, Moses never led a people before. David never fought a giant before. And Solomon never was a king before. But standing on the promises of God, they were successful not of themselves, but of God. Oh, glory. Oh, glory, standing on the promises of God. We need assurance. God also said that in verse 3 there that he would protect Abram. He says, and to the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now look at what Abram does in verse 4. So Abram went forth after hearing the assurance of God, Abram acted by faith. Abraham understood the assignment. The assignment to go forth and God assured him of his promise. And Abram responds to the command and it is demonstrated through action and not his speech. It was Moses that said in Acts 3.22, Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. See, we understand the assignment to give heed to everything that he says to us. And we will receive the promise of eternal life. There in Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. And the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. God can't lie. His promises he will always fulfill when standing on the promises of God. We will need to be reminded. Look at verse 7. The Lord 
appeared to Abram and said, To you, to your descendants, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. See, the Lord reminds Abram of his promise to him. We need to be reminded of the promises of God. 2 Peter 3, 2, he says that you should remember the words spoken. Remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Deuteronomy 8, 11, Moses told the children of Israel, beware that you do not forget the Lord your God. Lord doesn't want us to forget him, but beware that you do not forget. Look at verse 18 to, through 20, Deuteronomy 8. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who has given you power to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant which he swore to your fathers. As it is this day, it shall come about if you ever forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you today that you will surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so you shall perish, because you will not listen to the voice of the Lord your God. God reminds us because we tend to forget God. Psalms 111 in verse 4. The Bible says he has made his wonders to be remembered. Every day we wake up and look around. We ought to remember God. The wonders of the human in the image of God. The skies and the fowl in the air. Everywhere we look, it is the wonder of God. And God said in Psalms 111.4, He has made His wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. It says there that the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants, I will give this land. Now the Lord had already told him he'd make him a great nation. So through his descendants, or his seed would come great glory. It would be inhabited for peculiar people. The seeds of divine knowledge were to be sown there for the benefit of mankind. God was fulfilling his promise right in the face of Abraham. And God is fulfilling his promise right in our face because salvation has appeared to all men. That's a promise fulfilled. See, the Bible says in Titus 2.11, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Glory. God has fulfilled his promise through his son, and it came by way of the seed of Abraham. It is through his line that the Messiah would appear to mankind. His descendants. Give to this land. Bible says in verse 8, Then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon his name. And by this act of devotion, Abram made an open profession of his faith, worshiped the true God, and declared his faith in the promise. We need to have an open profession of our faith because Jesus died in public. Why should we serve him in private? Glory. We should declare our faith in the promise. But remember, it was there at Bethel that he called on the Lord. When standing on the promises of God, we will face difficulties. Look at verse number 10. It says, now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there. 
for the famine was severe in the land. And it came about when he came near to Egypt that he said to Sarah, his wife, see now, I know that you are a beautiful woman. Now, Abram, you have just worshipped at Bethel. Now he's at a difficult time and the famine is severe. Verse 13, please say that you are my sister so that it may go well with me because you and that I may live on account of you. It came about when Abram came into Egypt. The Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful and Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her to Pharaoh and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Notice that fin, sin affects us. And when we're standing on the promises of God and we face difficult challenges, we must understand that sin will cause us to affect others. First Peter 5, 7 says, having cast all of your anxiety on him because he cares about you. And when we are in a difficult place, we should cast all of our cares on the Lord. Notice that when standing on the promises of God, we think that uh, sometimes that human wisdom may be uh, more effective then godly wisdom. Look what happens when uh, Abram did things his way. Uh, he treated Abram well for his sake, for her sake, gave him sheep and oxen and donkeys and males and female servants and female donkeys and camels. But the Lord struck Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because Sarai, Abram's wife, Bible says that if we fail him, that our sin will find us out. If you will not do, uh, the Bible says in Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived, God is no fool, whatsoever a man sow, that shall he reap. No man will get away with anything. Numbers 32, 23 says, but if you will not do so, Behold, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. And Abram's sin found him out. He was deceptive to Egypt, deceptive to Pharaoh, and his sin found him out. The Bible says that Abram, after he had deceived Pharaoh, noticed that in his deception, Abram, that his sin affected so many things around him. If you notice, after making this open profession and Abram faces this difficulty, I want you to know that his conduct was uh, inconsistent with his character as the servant of God. It showed that he had a reliance on human wisdom instead of godly wisdom. Abram trusted the worldly way, and he not only sinned himself, but he tempted his wife Sarai to sin also. In his deception, Abram's sin affected him, affected Sarai, affected the king of Egypt, which affected the people of Egypt. It affected the Lord. It affected his faith. It affected his relationship with God. See, sin will take you further than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay. The effect of sins, how we should respond to difficulty, I'm going to share with you here. And he went a little beyond on Jesus in Mark 14, 34, and he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and watch. And he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass by him. Jesus says, My soul is deeply grieved. He's in a difficult place. Verse 36, And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. 
But remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but you will. And in difficult times, that is our response. Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. And if we believe that, and we say, Father, but it's nevertheless not our will, but that your will be done, we shouldn't turn to our human way. We should turn to the Lord and plead with him. And after Abram, notice in Genesis chapter 13. So Abram went from Egypt to the Negev. This is after he was escorted, reprimanded, escorted out of Egypt because of his sin. He returned to a familiar place where we all need to be. He went on his journey from Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and I. Listen, he came back to where he called on the Lord. He came back to Bethel, and Bethel is the house of worship. And Abram is the example that when you have an Egypt moment, if follow it up, with a Bethel moment, call on the name of the Lord. Notice here, Abram came back to where he was. Maybe it was his conscience. I don't know what it was. But Abram had an Egypt moment when he lied and he sinned and he caused trouble for him and his wife or in his family. But uh, Abram came back. He followed up that sin with a Bethel moment, and there he called on the Lord. Abram went back to where he formerly was, where we need to be, calling on the name of the Lord. Revelations 2.5, it says, Therefore remember from where you have fallen, and repent, and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you, and I will remove your lampstand out of his place, he said to the church in Ephesus, unless you repent. Acts 13, or Acts 319, therefore repent and return, so that your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Abram had to come back to the house of and call on the name of the Lord. Paul said in Acts twenty two sixteen. 16. Now why do you delay? Don't delay. Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins. Calling on his name. See you don't have to stay in Egypt. There's trouble in Egypt. But in Bethel there's glory. See. It is good that God interfered because Abram may have been tempted to stay in Egypt and forget about the promise. But he followed it up with a Bethel moment. You don't have to stay in Egypt. Come on down to Bethel and call on his name if you let God do it. Instead of you doing it yourself, you'll get better results. Remember the little girl and her mother that went into the candy store. They didn't have enough money to pay for the candy. So the man behind the counter says, go ahead, little girl. You can have some candy. And the little girl just stood there. And the man behind the counter says, no, it's all right, little girl. You can have some candy. And the little girl just stood there. So the man behind the counter reached down with both hands and got two big handfuls of candy and gave it to the little girl. And her mother turned to her and says, well, why didn't you get the candy? She said, Mom, his hands are bigger than mine. Let God do it. See, God's hands are bigger than yours. You'll get more out of life if you let God do it. Because God's hands are, are, are bigger than yours. Glory. Today, you don't have to stay in Bethel. Come on. Um, you don't have to stay in Egypt, excuse me. Come on down to Bethel 
and call on his name. If you've had an Egypt moment this week or whenever, you need to follow it up with a Bethel moment and call on his name. You've heard the word of the Lord this day. Do you believe what you've heard? Repent, be baptized for the remission of your sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you've fallen away today, you can come on to Bethel and call on his name. As together we stand and sing the song of invitation. Please turn your hymn books to 836. 836.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are truly grateful to be here this morning, to be able to hear a message from your word, to be able to take to heart the encouragement that we have that to learn from about Abraham and about his early work with you and to be able to realize that he struggled as we struggle, to realize that he can correct himself as we can correct ourselves. To be able to realize, Father, that we can get strength from you. To realize, Father, as we look around in this world, that there is brothers and sisters that do not know where they will get their next meal. Brothers and sisters that are trying to spread your word in foreign countries they have to face a difficult choice of denying you or in order to live or proclaiming your word and possibly facing death. And realizing, Father, that what we face in our daily lives is very minor. That we should seek encouragement from your word. That we should seek encouragement from one another. That we should realize that the difficulties we have are very minor. We should realize, Father, that we have brothers and sisters within this very family that are facing life and death from illness. We should realize, Father, that we have brothers and sisters that are in need. And we should realize, Father, that we have brothers and sisters that are in doubt that need our encouragement to strengthen them in the faith. Father, we draw encouragement from you, and we are so grateful that we have words from the pulpit, that we have the book of life to read from, that we can draw this encouragement. Father, we are truly blessed to be in your presence today. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, for it's in his name that we pray, amen.